Who of you has seen the film Avatar? In case you haven't seen it or don't remember the plot, it's about the indigenous Navi people living on the planet of Pandora. They live in tune with nature on this beautiful planet when greedy humans arrive in spaceships on the horizon, ready to exploit the planet's natural resources. Avatar is one of the most successful films ever, but there's an unusual phenomenon about it. It's called the post-Avatar depression. All over the world, people leave the doors of the cinemas, longing for that life in the lush nature and in tune with the planet. However, back in their daily lives, they often feel sad, helpless and overwhelmed because they believe that a life in tune with nature might not be possible for them. So why do we project this beautiful life in tune with nature to another planet and even an alien people? My journey began very much on this planet. To be precise, in this house. It's in Nuhue, a world house built by the indigenous Kogi people of the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta. They have been living there for millennia. They invited me to spend a few weeks and a few months with them in their villages and after I met one of the elders in Germany. Hardly any of them ever travel abroad or even leave their own mountains. But after spending some time together and befriending each other for a while, he invited me to come to their village. Upon my arrival, where it's a village where hardly any outsiders are allowed to go, on, and upon my arrival, he asked me to write a book for them and bring their message to the world. So I sit there in the Nuhue, built by the descendants of the great Tyrona civilization. The Tyrona could be named in one sentence with the Incas, the Aztecs and the Mayas, all the great civilizations we know from our history books. However, the Kogi, their descendants, have been able to preserve their ancient ways. The Tyrona were the greatest goldsmiths of South America and presumably the builders of the mystical city of El Dorado. The Kogi have kept their highly advanced social and environmental technologies that until today enables them to regenerate land much quicker and more biodiverse than most of our Western societies. So I sit there, surrounded by 30 kogis in the Nuhue. Of course, the walls are new, the roof is new, but since 4,000 years, there stands in Nuhue, a world house, at exactly this place. Since 4,000 years, the indigenous people of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta gather to speak about how to live in tune with nature, just as the Navi in our science fiction film. So I tell them about our struggles, especially about the fact that we know so much about the destruction of the environment and still, as a society, find it collectively very hard to act effectively upon it. At first, they couldn't comprehend what I was saying. But after a while, they said, Lucas, we have a question for you. What kind of place is the Earth for you? What do you really believe about her? And what is your role on her? I was very surprised by that question because I simply never thought about it before. And after I tried to stumble a few words in my answer, I said, I think about it well before I reply. And so I did. After reflecting a while upon it, I realized that the conflict depicted in the Avatar film was actually happening inside of me. Even though I wished the planet to be that beautiful place I wanted to tune in life in tune with nature on her, there was a part of me that believed that this planet might actually rather be about struggle, conflict and competition for scarce resources. Going deeper, I asked myself, is my life actually a benefit to Earth and her beings, or rather a burden to life? 
Having been taught to, in our, in our educational system to strive for better grades, more prestigious universities, higher paying jobs, I came to realize that it's this type of life that would eventually lead humanity having to fly to other planets to exploit them. After I shared my answer with the Kogi, they pointed out that they perceived our society to be at the age of adolescence. Because it's normally in the age of puberty that we go around, try to find our place in life, our place in the community, and test our boundaries. Now I understood why they call us the younger brothers and sisters. So what are we collectively thinking about the Earth? What is the story we tell ourselves about it? Of course, we come from a time of domination, where we've conquered each other, exploited the Earth's natural resources, but that mindset, even though we're still practicing it, becomes more and more outdated. Now we're being offered the narrative of being parasites to the Earth. Especially in the field of sustainability, after our frustration of yet another climate conference without results, yet another sustainability goal not met, we ask ourselves deep down, might the Earth maybe actually be better off without us? And I came to know that many people feel that way. But it is, yeah, it is, it, it is in a way very, very difficult to live like that and to live in that way. And it doesn't have to be that way. Because indigenous people all over the world have shown us that we can li li live life in a different way. All over the world, indigenous people have shown us that we can live on Earth without destroying her and distracting the natural resources. However, the Kogi, on another night in the Nohue, took it a step further. They said, Lucas, you know, we need the Earth to survive. We should treat her well. But did you know the Earth needs us to thrive as well? Again, I was really surprised, and it totally challenged my self-perception and my whole worldview. And I asked myself, what if this is true? So I researched about it, and I found out not only the Kogi have been living that way, all over the world, indigenous people have actually played a vital role in life. They've actually contributed to life and played a vital role in the ecosystems by, for example, increasing topsoil, creating habitat, or fostering biodiversity. In some parts of the Amazon rainforest that are managed by indigenous people, biodiversity is actually higher than in the parts that are left wild and uninhabited. So, maybe what the Kogi told me in Nohue was actually true. Maybe we humans can actually be what is called a keystone species, playing a vital role in the ecosystems we interact with. So I've brought you three examples today that illustrate what I mean. In 2020, there were huge wildfires burning in Australia. The flames went as high as a house and the sky turned red, but not in the lands of Australian Aborigines. Some of them have regularly ignited low-temperature fires on the Ryan time of year. And those low-temperature fires burned away the dry grass and the excess vegetation. Through that, they were able not only to keep themselves and their homes safe, but they were fertilizing the soil with its ashes. They haven't burned everything at the same time, but don't burn different patches in different years. So the plants coming afterwards are in different stages of succession, creating biodiversity. This practice, however, has been largely forbidden nowadays in Australia. My second example comes from the Kogi. It's a community practice. It's called Aluna Jiwasi. It's a practice they use to resolve conflict and uh, clear emotions. So they meet together every few, every few weeks in the villages and say everything good and everything bad that they've said or thought about the others. Like that, emotions become seen, acknowledged, conflict resolved long before, before it becomes a serious issue. And they tell me that through that, they have been able to prevent war and eventually the destruction of the environment. Just imagine doing this in our families, in our organizations, in our cities. How could the world look like? 
So I was finding these amazing examples from all over the place, and I asked myself, did we also in Europe, in my home, have these practices? So I've brought to you today an example that is called the Hutewald, and it's from my home area in Germany, but was practiced in different forms all over Europe. It basically entails moving animals such as pigs, horses or cattle into a forest to feed on the naturally occurring foods. Like that, the animals move around, loosen up the soil, provide habitat, fertilizing it and, and um, allow rare plants to grow. At the same time, farmers didn't have to grow food for these animals, somewhere else have to import it, and it allowed for small, let's say, local varieties of pigs, for example, to live in a very specific environment. However, just as our Australian burnings, the Hutewald has been largely forbidden and thus lost over the last centuries. But it is not about these examples, or at least not only. It is not only about finding these amazing practices from all over the world, learning about them and applying them. Because there are already books full of these examples, but we're not using them. So I ask myself, why is that? These examples often come from a very specific place and a very specific time. So we can't just have, for example, a random government official turning up somewhere, burning grass somewhere else, because it would probably create more destruction than anything else. They come from a specific time and thus from a specific mindset. People developing these practices are deeply in tune with nature, have this deeply intimate relationship with nature that allowed them to develop these practices. So going back and forth on these questions with the Kogi for years, I came to the point that it's actually about the culture and eventually about the consciousness that these practices emerge from. Every culture in the world is a response to our most fundamental beliefs about the world. So if we believe that we are dominators or parasites, we will create dominating or parasitic cultures dominating and parasitic societies, dominating and parasitic organizations, because they are rooted in our dominating and parasitic relationships. If we believe, however, that we are a keystone species, we will create keystone cultures, keystone societies, keystone organizations, because they are rooted in our keystone relationships. So, at this point, I'd like to introduce a friend of mine. Please, meet Juan. Juan is 12 years old. He's a Kogi boy who followed me around in one of the villages. And one day I asked him, Juan, what do you want to be when you're grown up? He just looked at me like, what is wrong with this guy? And um, I said, no, I mean, when you're grown up, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a Kogi. I was like, yeah, that's kind of obvious, but what does it mean to you? And he said, it means to take responsibility for myself, for my community, and for the land that was left to me by my ancestors. 12 years old. These are the answers from a boy growing up in a Keystone culture and being a representative of Keystone consciousness. So, how do we do it? How do we, as a globalized society, become indigenous to Earth again? How do we become a Keystone culture again? On another night in the Nuhue, one of the Kogi's elders said to me, you know, Being indigenous doesn't mean you have to come from a specific place or a specific people. It's how you relate to the earth. So, we're in relationships all the time, with ourselves, with our parents, our children, our colleagues, of course our partners, and with the earth. Relationships can be mutually nourishing, or can be disbalanced if one side takes more. Relationships can be really good if we're in tune with the other, really listening to who the other person is, really tuning in, or just projecting on them who we want them to be or believe them to be. We can have the best or the worst time with our partners, depending if we're in a true relationship. Of course, relationships are also about boundaries, my own, but also boundaries of the other. Planetary boundaries, sounds familiar, right? So, right now, I asked the Kogi, so what is the one thing that we can do? The one thing. And they've said, you need to improve your intimate 
relationships. They didn't say we should put a price on carbon or, um, or, or a plant tree somewhere else. It's about the intimate relationships. And for the Earth, we need to grow up. We need to be the adults again in a relationship. Of course, we have been children all the time, taking like a child takes from, her, from his mother, but, and, and maybe then growing up to become adults, uh, become adolescents, testing our boundaries, going around. So we need to be in a love relationship again. We need to grow up. We need to become the partners that take, but as well as give, as many indigenous people have shown us over the last millennia all over the world. <laughs> Humans feel that we are supposed to be a keystone species. That's why people become depressed after watching the Avatar film, because we sense that we, the way we live right now is far from our true, true nature. Healing the relationships with ourselves, with others and with the Earth is how we become indigenous to Earth again. Like that, we will not just be living in balance on the Earth, but become regenerative co-creators on life on this planet. So let's not confuse our current systems and our current beliefs about the world with who we truly are. Maybe the Earth could survive without us, but who could the Earth be with us? Thank you.